It happens in every friendship, in every family. It's not the easiest thing to do by far. For some, it's almost impossible. We are better people today because certain people in our lives have really gone above and beyond. They've loved us. They've watched out for us. They've warned us when we've gone astray. And that's why it's so difficult. That's why it could be a challenge. That's why when we think about these things, we often wonder, can I do this? Should I do this? And how should I do this? So you might be asking, well, what is it that's so difficult? What is it that is such a challenge for some of us to do at times? Well, it's actually quite simple. It's when you and I have to speak with somebody about a difficult topic and encourage them to do something that you know is right. And when they do what's right, you know they're going to have some problems as they listen. They're going to have some problems as they take steps. But you, as somebody who loves them, you make the effort to speak with them. Now, sometimes, and this has happened to all of us at one point or another, we have something difficult to say to somebody. We have something that is true and, and is right, and they need to hear it. But sometimes we don't immediately jump and, and do it and take action. We say, well, I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm going to give it some time. I'm going to pray through this. But ultimately, if we love that person and we want what's best for them, we're going to tell them the truth in a loving and in a gentle way. This morning, what we have here in the book of Philemon is a loving, gentle letter. It's a letter from a friend, Paul, to a spiritual son in the faith, Onesimus. It's a letter that's motivated by love, and what I'm hoping that happens by the end of the service, you'll come to understand how God writes us a letter of love for us to do the very same thing in our context. Notice here, if you would open your bulletin, at Proverbs 27.9. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And it says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad. So a man's counsel is sweet to his friends. Many of us here today are thankful because we've gotten emails, text messages, conversations from people who genuinely, genuinely love us. And they've told us some things, and, and we haven't always received it as we should. But we know deep down in their hearts, they love us. The only reason they're telling us this is because they love us. And although there are some consequences to us taking action, we know they really have our best interests at heart. So as you look at your notes, we start with this idea. Paul writes a letter of thankfulness along with a personal challenge to his friend Philemon. So the first thing you need to understand is that this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to his dear friend Philemon, somebody who he led to faith in Christ, and now he needs to write him a letter to encourage him and challenge him. Now, just to give you a little bit of background during this time in Rome, there were some 60 million slaves, they estimated, during the time of Rome. It was a, a time of Roman slavery. About one-third of all Rome were considered slaves. And it was a very difficult time in the culture. There was a lot of enforcement of rules and laws and different things. And what Paul does is he begins to challenge his son in the faith, Onesimus, to look at the law of love more than the law of the culture. And I think that's very similar to what you and I have to do today. There is a law of the culture, if you will. There's a law of the land, and God gives us a law of love. And that law is the law that we are to follow. And what we're going to see here today is, sometimes as you and I take a step forward and we obey this law of love, that we're going to be criticized, we're going to be misunderstood, we might even be ridiculed or mocked. But when it's all said and done, this is the most important thing we can follow. God's love manifested through us to others. So here's the challenge for you today. Just as Paul writes this letter to Onesimus, I really believe 
God has written a letter to us, to you, to me. And it may not be the exact same circumstance, but I think we can all find some parallels here with our lives and with the life of Philemon. The second thing I want you to consider is that every time you decide, I am going to follow God, I'm going to follow God's ways, there will always be criticism. Somebody will critique you, somebody might mock you, somebody may dismiss you. But the reality is God's love, God's law, is the most important thing for us to follow. So let's write this down as the first point under the subpoint. It says, God changed relational challenges into powerful opportunities of faith and love. Relational challenges, God changed them into powerful opportunities of faith and love. And during this time of year, we get into, you know, right at November 1st, we all get into that holiday landslide, right? The holidays are here. They're coming fast. We have to plan. We have to put things in order. And the next thing you know, the year is over. And during this time, although it's usually a time of great celebration, a lot of food, a lot of flung, thank the Lord, you know, all this other stuff, the reality is it is a time of great tension for many relationships. It's a time of great tension when you're going to see that person that you really don't want to see and you only see them twice a year or once a year it's tension at work it's tension in your neighborhood so these things are here to help us so let's take a look at philemon chapter 1 verse 1 paul the apostle says paul a prisoner for christ jesus so he was in jail and it says and timothy our brother to philemon Notice how he describes him. He says, our beloved fellow worker, and Athea, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the church first started, the church did not begin in a large building like this one. The church started in homes. They met in homes during the week. They met in the synagogues on the weekend. But for the most part, the bulk of the activity in the early church was in a home. So somebody, typically someone of, you know, higher wealth status, they they offered up their home. And in this case, he had a home. He had a large home. He had a church who actually met in his home. So Paul is writing a letter. And I want you to think about this, and we'll get to it later. He's writing a letter to a friend who's going to read this letter before his family, who's going to read this letter before the entire church. Now, we don't know what the contents are fully yet, but we're going to get there. So look at verse 4. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Are you thankful when you pray? I want you to think about something. As you pray, who are the people you pray for the most in your thankfulness? You know, I thank God for, you know, my wife, for my daughter, Savannah, you know, for my son, Luke, for my future daughter-in-law, Crystal, who's going to take my son with her. You know, I'm so grateful for, you know, all these people. And I pray for them in my life constantly. But who are you thankful for? Seriously, who, who do you thank God for repeatedly? Isn't it true that the people you thank for repeatedly are people that you genuinely love and care about so he says you know i thank you i thank god for you that's what he's saying because here's the reason i hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the lord jesus and for all of the saints so paul identifies two things in this man's life you love god you love the lord jesus and you love the people of the church god's people so this should be evident and visible in our lives If you say that Christ is your Savior, the two distinguishing marks, among others, in your life should be what? A love for God and a love for other people. This should not be a secret. This should not be, well, I wonder who they... No, this should be obvious that you love God and you love God's people, and therefore you also love others. So here are a couple things that we need to keep in mind. Here's the first one. We learn more about God when we read His Word but we experience more of God when we do His Word. It doesn't matter how many times 
I read the manual in my car on how to fix something that may be broken. It doesn't matter how many times I watch the YouTube videos over and over again by different publishers on how to fix something in my car. Until I actually do it and get my hands dirty and get under the hood, I'm not really going to learn it. I only know it in theory. God doesn't want us just to listen to what he has to say in his word. He doesn't want us to just, you know, say a, a prayer here or there. He wants us to experience him. The way you experience God is by following what he says. And one of the challenges today is to follow his love for other people. Look at the second point. It says God wants to reveal the world all. He wants to reveal to the world, excuse me, all of the goodness that we have in Christ Jesus. All of the goodness that we have in Christ, in Christ Jesus. When we accept Christ as our Savior, the goodness of God dwells in us. You, you may see this in your cable package, but there are certain channels where you can watch, you know, historical crimes or, you know, CSI or different things like 24-7, 365 days a year. So we all recognize that there's a lot of evil and there's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of evil in this world. But did you know in Christ, there's also a lot of good in us as well. So what God wants to do is he wants to bring out that goodness so that you can make his love and his name visible to others. Let's look at verse 4, or verse 6 rather. He says, And I pray, this is Paul praying, that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Now the word effective here means powerful. It means something in, in good working order. That's what he's talking about. So he says, I want your faith to become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing. That is, for the sake of Christ. Look at verse 7. He says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. How many of you today have someone in your life that every time you bump into them or every time you speak to them by phone or video chat, you feel refreshed by the conversation or by their presence? How many of you? They're just a joy to be around. Now, how many of you have somebody in your life that every time you're around them, they just kind of sink you into a hole and you're like, oh my Lord, here we go again. <laughs> you know, we all have people like that. But Paul is saying, listen, you are the kind of person, Philemon, that every time I'm around you, I am so encouraged. When I'm down, you come for me. When I'm up and I'm just, you know, full of joy, you meet me right there. I love being around you. I collect strength from being around you. So he's setting up this stage for what he's about to ask him. He's wanting Philemon to know that, listen, you are the reason that I can rest. As a matter of fact, the word also implies a military unit stopping and taking rest. You know, after marching for several hours, they stop and they take rest so they can refresh themselves and continue. Now, what you're going to notice in this small letter is the following. There is nothing that Philemon is doing that Paul has to correct them on. You can read this letter over and over again. You're not going to find one single thing. That is so different from the rest of Paul's letter. It's almost like he's cracking a whip and he's telling people not to do this and stop doing this. Not so with Philemon. Philemon is, is different. Philemon is someone who empowers others. He's somebody who is an encouragement. Now, one of the things that you're going to find as we read this story is that the reason why Paul is making his case to help Philemon, to help Onesimus, that we'll get to in a minute, is that he's asking Philemon to consider God's love in all that he does. So this is the challenge. Paul challenges Philemon to allow love to guide his decisions. I want you to stop and think for a minute. What would have been different this week if you and I would have allowed every decision to be guided, not by pressure, not by finances, not by hurt, but by God's 
love, how would our week have changed? So if I decide, if we decide, you know, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to allow the love of God to overwhelm my thinking, to lead my practice. There's some implications there, and it's here in your notes. It says, by doing this, it means we're accepting the implications, the implications of relational debt. And this is evidence of love and a mark of spiritual maturity. We're accepting the implications. What happens when somebody owes us? And we're going to get to that in a minute. But this is evidence that we really love God and we really love people. So let's take a look at verse 8. Paul says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I appeal to you. I prefer to appeal to you. So Paul is who? He's the famous Apostle Paul. There is no one in the New Testament that wrote more than the Apostle Paul. So he is the New Testament authority. You know, he's writing letters to different churches, and he's writing this letter specifically to Philemon, to his family, and to his church. And he says, you know, Philemon, I can force you to do what I'm about to ask you. I have that authority. But I'm not going to use that authority. I'm not going to leverage that authority. I'm going to ask you to do something on a different appeal, on the appeal of love. And notice how personal he gets. He says, I, Paul, an old man. Now, he really wasn't that old. He was only about 60 years old. But in those days, people didn't live, you know, very long, at least not in Rome. So he says, now an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ. So he was incarcerated. And notice verse 10. I appeal to you for my child. So he is actually not using his authority. He's saying, listen, I'm asking you for the sake of my child, Onesimus. Now, Onesimus was not his physical child. Onesimus was his spiritual child. He had helped Onesimus come to faith in Christ. And notice what he says. Whose father I have become in my imprisonment now formally verse 11 he was useless to you but now he is indeed useful to you and to me so back to the context during this time there were about 60 million slaves in rome onesimus was the slave of philemon he left philemon's house he stole from philemon and in a large area like Rome, in a large city like Rome, he meets the Apostle Paul. Of all people, he meets the Apostle Paul. Interestingly enough, the name Onesimus means useful. That's what his name means. But because of what he did, he was actually considered useless. Now notice what Paul does. Paul says, look, I know what he did, and you probably put him in a category as useless. Now, let, let's be honest. Sometimes when people offend us and they've stolen something from us, they've hurt us or they've hurt someone in our family deeply, what do we do sometimes? What do we do? We kind of what? We put them aside. We treat them like what? Trash. Trash. We do. You say, no, no, Marcel, I don't, I don't do that. Well, I think we all have done that. And I definitely include myself in that. Because when someone offends you, when someone does something intentionally to hurt you or to take something from you, it, it starts penetrating into the depths of your heart. And at that moment, we've got to make a choice. Am I going to live with this or am I going to forgive? Am I going to hold on or am I going to just make things right as best as I can? And here's what we discovered. When you don't forgive someone, and you're going to notice forgiveness is not even mentioned in this text but it is implied throughout the entire book when you and i refuse to forgive someone you know what we do we slowly begin to treat someone like trash like they don't matter like they are not important so paul says look maybe you thought he was useless but i'm saying to you he is useful to both you and 
me. Now, when you read this letter, this is such a personal letter. You know, this is not like the letter to the Corinthians where they were just a mess. This is not like a letter to the Romans. This is a different kind of letter. Paul said, look, I am weak, I'm in prison, and I'm asking you, please, look at Onesimus. I know he committed a crime, but I want you to think of him as a brother. I want you to think of him through spiritual eyes. Look at verse 12. He says, I, Paul speaking, I am sending him back to you, sending, notice the intimacy, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. So, what's happening here? Paul is saying, you know, Philemon, I can use my apostolic authority, right? I can use my apostolic authority and say, he's going to stay here with me, he's serving me, he's helping me. Philemon, hey bro, just deal with it. Just, you know, suck it up, buttercup. Just deal with it. He didn't say that. He said, you know, I'm not even going to assume that this is okay with you. He's very gentle. You know, you can't force somebody to forgive. Did you know that? You can't do that. I cannot force anyone to forgive. You cannot force anyone to forgive. Forgiveness is in the heart. Forgiveness is something that we have to come to terms with as this is what honors God and there is no better expression of God's love than when we forgive other people there's no better expression that is what love looks like but there was something different about Onesimus imagine this guy telling Paul his story you know I left Rome I stole some things Paul, I'm here with you. I'm going to help you. And Paul leads him to Christ, and he begins to serve Paul, but he still has a relational debt with Philemon. What do we mean by relational debt? Relational debt is when someone breaks an agreement. This has happened to all of us. Stops doing what they said they would do or sins against us. So let me repeat that. Relational debt is when someone breaks an agreement, stops doing what they said they would do, or sins against us. Now, this has happened. We don't even have to raise our hands. This has happened to every single one of us. And some of us have been the cause of relational debt to someone else. That's just a reality. But when this happens to us, when somebody creates a relational debt... And they owe us, owe us. If we don't forgive that person, we begin to treat them like less of a person. I've seen this over and over and over again. I've seen it outside of church. I've seen it in church. I've seen it in families. I've seen it in friendships. It happens all the time. So Paul is understanding that Onesimus has a huge debt. He's cost Philemon money. He's cost him time. He's cost him materials. But here's what you have to understand, and this is a very important principle. It's right here in your notes. It is better to forgive all relational debt. Let me repeat that. It is better to forgive all relational debt. Regardless of the debt, it's better for you and I to forgive. So let's say that all together. Ready? One, two, three. It is better to forgive all relational debt. Now, what we're not saying is that this is easy. Right? What we're not saying is that, oh, that's just, yeah, I'll forgive him. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is having the capacity to forgive someone not based on whether or not everything's going to be made right, but based on the simple reality that Christ has forgiven us everything. When we owed him 
everything and could repay nothing. During my life, and during those of you who have accepted Christ as your Savior, when you trusted Christ, you went to Christ, you prayed and asked Him to forgive you of your sins, He forgave you everything, even knowing that you could repay back nothing. That's what God wants from us. That's what He's asking us. He's asking us to forgive all relational debt. But there are some implications. The implications of forgiveness should not stop our forgiveness. You say, you know, Marcel, but if I forgive this person for what they have done, that's going to cause serious problems in my family. That's going to really shake things up. I mean, I'm going to get flack. I know it. I'm going to be criticized. I know it. You just don't understand this What they did is really, really deep. God says to forgive all relational debt. So Paul's writing this letter. Paul's not getting out of prison at that moment. He is writing this letter to give to Onesimus, for Onesimus to give to Philemon, for Philemon to read this to his wife, for Philemon to read this to his son, and for Philemon to read the letter before the entire church community. Now notice what verse 12 says. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be out of compulsion, but of your own accord. So we read that. So notice the next point here in your notes. The next point says, if I can find it, sorry. I'm sorry, verse 17. Let's jump to verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, He says, charge that to whose account? Charge that to whose account? My account. All right, now let me go back here because I think I skipped a couple things and I apologize for that. The next one in the blank is God is just, correct? Okay. So here's the question we have to ask. Why should I forgive someone who doesn't care, who doesn't deserve it, who will never ask for forgiveness. Why should I do that? God is just. God will take care of all of our losses. Whatever we have lost, God can take care of our losses. God is able. He is able to heal our wounds and every relational hurt. You may have said this, but I don't feel like forgiving that person right now. Forgiveness is really not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision to move forward and not live in the bondage of unforgiveness. When you read through the scriptures, you see equivalents, murder, hatred, bitterness. Unforgiveness is there too. As we look at these things, we have to remember, God cannot heal my heart until I follow his word on what he says. If I want God to heal my heart, if I want him to heal the pain that this person has caused me, I have to be willing to do what he says first and then trust that he can heal my heart. It's not the other way around. It's not, Lord, give me the feelings that I want to forgive this person and then I will forgive. It starts with obeying God. As you obey God, God can take care of those feelings. He's done it for years. He can do it in your life. 
The next thing is that God reconciles. He will guide us to reconcile with others. You're at Walmart and you're doing some shopping and you see somebody who offended you and you can't believe you, you see them, you would never see them before, and you see them. And you're like, ah, And you go down a different aisle. Not even going to buy anything. Oh, you just go down a different aisle. Then you're at the gas station. They just so happen to be at the gas station on the other side. And then you go to CVS and you're picking up a prescription and guess who's in line waiting for the prescription? And you can't get away from this person. God often wants us to deal with these things, not just ignore them. Time does not heal all wounds. We can't just keep ignoring things and pretend they're going to get better. But listen, this is something that we all wrestle with. We've all been offended. We've all been stolen. You know, someone has stolen something, some property or something from us. So this is something that's very real. And I can promise you as we get into the holiday season, for some of you it's going to be even more real. But notice what it says. For Philemon, forgiveness meant receiving the offender. That's step number one. Accepting the consequences and not living in the pain of what happened. Let me repeat that. For Philemon and for many of us, Forgiveness means receiving the offender, accepting the consequences, and not living in the pain of what happened. He's asking Philemon to do something that is significant. Spiritually significant, relationally significant. He's asking, it's a big ask. But notice this quote by Pastor Craig Groeschel. He says, Forgiveness doesn't change what happened in the past. But it can change what happens in the future. I remember I got a call from a guy, and it had been a long time since we had talked. And, you know, we had talked, and, and he asked me, he said, would you forgive me? And I said to him, I said, you know, I forgave you many months ago. Now, I, I wish I could stand and say, well, that always happens. I always forgive people just, you know. No, it doesn't. Sometimes, you know, things hurt and, and, and you're wrestling with it. But you know what we learn in Scripture? The best thing we can do is forgive the offense of others as quickly as possible, as quickly as it comes to our mind, and let God deal with the consequences. The challenge that we have sometimes is we want to coordinate the consequences. We want to make sure they get what they deserve. And, and listen, that's not our job. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, the Lord speaking. I will repay. Do you believe that God is just? If you do, God will repay in his time. So Philemon is a great example for us. He's an example of faith and love. So this entire letter is about a godly man who is being challenged to do something godly. And he's a great example. So here's some of the things that he did. It says he practiced a genuine faith in Christ and a genuine love for others. It was obvious that this guy Philemon loved the Lord. He loved people. You know, he, if he could refresh the Apostle Paul, I mean, if he can encourage him, he can encourage anyone. Number two, it says, he refreshed, strengthened, and blessed others. That's what he was known for. He was a guy that would encourage you. He was a guy that would help you move forward. He was a guy that would not allow you to stay stuck. He would push you forward, encourage you. Then it says he was motivated by a love for Christ and a love for for people. That's what his motivation was. He was a person. So Onesimus knew this. And he still left and he still ran away and he still stole. But he didn't do that because Philemon was a, a bad guy. Then it says he was compassionate with those who sinned against him. And we're going to see that in a minute. He was compassionate with those who sinned against him. 
And then it says he believed Jesus could change people. And this is the question for you and I. Do you believe that Jesus could change the life of someone who offended you? What happens if that person that offended you and, and hurt you and hurt in your family and they, they give you a call this afternoon and they said, hey, how you doing? Okay. Hey, I just want you to know that I was thinking about you. I was visiting a friend's church in a different state and the pastor was speaking about a relationship with Christ and that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory and and I realize that, you know, I've sinned, uh, I've sinned against you and, and your family, and I've hurt a lot of people. And at the end, I, I prayed and I accepted Christ. And then after church, they had this big, you know, barbecue type thing, and there was a lake there, and I got baptized. They gave me a Bible, and I'm going to come to your church next week. Is that okay with you? How would we respond? Do we really believe that God can change people? Do we really believe that the power of Christ can change someone who was dead to someone who has life? Philemon believed it. It says he put God's love into practice in his decision-making. In his decision-making. So as he made decisions, he put God's love into practice practice so here's the challenge now we're going to talk about us okay paul challenges us to trust in god's providence to guide our relationships there are two terms that work closely one with the other one is the sovereignty of god and one is the the providence of god the sovereignty of god is a theological term which simply means god is in control of all things at all times, at all times, in all places, God is in control. Nothing happens without his knowledge or his permission. But the providence of God is a little different. The providence of God is how God orchestrates things in life. Because God doesn't make you and me a robot. He gives us what? Free will. So we can choose to do things or choose to not do things. But in your decision to either follow God or not follow God... God begins to orchestrate things and coordinate things and move people and change situations for his divine purposes. So as we talk about this idea, Paul challenges us to trust what God is doing around us. It's a big challenge. But remember, it's better to forgive how much relational debt? All relational debt. So here's the first idea. Believing in God's providence influence us influences us to live by faith in love and in god's forgiveness that's really important if we believe that god is providential that god is sovereign we will live as such notice verse 15 verse 15 paul says for perhaps is why for this perhaps is why he talking about onesimus was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So what is Paul saying? Paul's saying, listen, I know this is not a great situation. I know that you and your family are, are hurting, I know you lost some money in your business, but, but hear me out, Philemon. What if God allowed Onesimus to leave and flee your home and, and just leave and let all these things happen for him to come to the knowledge of the truth so that now he will be returned to you not as you know, an employee or just another worker, but as a brother in Christ. He's saying, Philemon, I, I want you to consider this. I want you to consider that there's a bigger purpose here. And to you this morning, I, I want to say the same thing. There are things that happen in your life 
that you have no idea why they happen. What I can assure you of is God can work even those things, those hurts, those layoffs, those tragedies, those situations for His eternal purposes. We don't always understand why or how or what for, but we know God is providential. Look at verse 17. So he says, So if you, Philemon, if you consider me your partner, now he's talking in business terms, right? You're my partner. Receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, notice, charge that to my account. This is really interesting because he's saying to Philemon, Look, Philemon, I'm in prison. Obviously, when you are in prison, you're not making a whole lot of money. He had some money, but he says, look, if he has wronged you, if he has stolen from you, I will be the one to repay. I will be the one to make up his debt. And what I want you to do, Philemon, I want you to receive him as you receive me. Now look at verse 19. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. In other words, don't worry about your losses. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So now he's saying, look, let's, let's think about this for just a minute. I led Onesimus to faith in Christ, but I also led you to faith in Christ. You owe me, bro. You owe me. So listen, I'm willing to stay in prison and pay for Onesimus' debt if you are willing to accept him as you would accept me. So what he's saying is, Onesimus and I are equal brothers. Accept him as you would accept me. Now remember, this is the guy that stole. This is the guy that created problems with your wife and, and problems in the home and problems with your other employees. This is the guy that created the monster. I want you to accept him in the same way that you would receive and accept me. So look at verse 21. No pressure. Confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, I want you to picture the scene. Onesimus comes, and he gives this letter. He's with someone else. He gives the letter to Philemon. Philemon has to read this letter before his wife, before his son, and before the entire church body. So that would be like me reading this to you, and then he comes to the part that says, I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than what I say. And I'm looking at this guy here to my left thinking, okay. And everybody's sitting and everybody's watching and they're asking this question, what is Philemon going to do? Everybody knows what Onesimus did. Everyone knows that he's guilty. Everyone knows that in Roman law, he could actually be mistreated. He could actually be killed for his crime. But Paul is saying to Philemon, I know that the love of God dwells in you, Philemon. I know that the love for the brothers, it just resides in you. And I know that you are going to do even more, Philemon. And he's reading this letter to his church. So people are obviously thinking, what are you going to do, bro? What are you going to do? You know, you got to do something. What does Philemon do? God allows circumstances, sins, decisions, bad decisions, relational connections, all of these things to form part of his plan to reconcile people. God uses all of our mistakes, all of our errors, all of our sins, us and others, to bring people together in Christ. 
notice God wants to use us in the process of saving broken relationships you don't have to raise your hand but how many of you know a broken relationship all of us do God wants to use us as his children to do something about it not just ignore it but actually do something about it why because as we forgive and as we encourage other people to forgive we illustrate God's great forgiveness towards us that is one of the most powerful things we have it's the forgiveness of God to man of God to woman in Christ if we are willing to receive and accept those who offend us forgiveness is possible it really is if we're willing to allow God's love to guide us now here's what we especially us those of us that are Christians here's what we cannot forget at one point in our lives we all had a relational debt to God all of us and the worst part was that we were unable and still are unable to repay the debt back to God so all of us were found guilty before a holy God you say I've never murdered anyone maybe that's true but surely you've thought of murdering somebody no I haven't surely you've cursed somebody well okay well you've hated somebody oh okay you got me now so here's what we're saying every single one of us in action word or thought have broken one of God's Ten Commandments and because of that we have a debt that we cannot repay we have a debt that is so big we can't even make a dent in that debt so what did God do God sent his son born of a virgin came to this earth to live without sin he was tempted like you and I are tempted every single day but he chose not to sin he lived he healed he helped he served and then he voluntarily went to the cross why did he go to the cross because on the cross he made full payment turn to your neighbor and say full payment he made full payment he made full payment for your sins and my sins when he shed his blood on the cross and he died and they buried him and after three days he was risen from the dead and now the Bible tells us if someone comes to faith in Christ if someone admits I'm a sinner forgive me for my sins Lord I believe in Christ and what he's done their relational debt to God is canceled Marcel do I have to write a check no you don't have enough money in your account can I use my credit card no there's not enough credit on your card can I you know sacrifice a, a chicken or a goat or something no it doesn't make a difference your debt is beyond repair you can't repay it Jesus Christ paid the debt now if that is you and God has forgiven you this great unpayable debt he says to you and me now just as Christ has forgiven us we are to forgive others I don't expect them to say I'm sorry I don't expect them to pay back what they took all I have to do is forgive them and live in forgiveness and let God take care of the consequences if I can't do that then I really don't know God if I can't forgive someone in the same way that Christ has forgiven me then I really don't know this love of Christ that Paul is writing I have no idea what that's about because that's the same love that he says you are to forgive someone else now the character of people of faith and love and hopefully that's us the character is that they trust in God's providence 
I don't have to stress. We don't have to worry. We don't have to just, you know, what's going to happen here? Listen, God can take care of every evil. It happens all the time. You know, I remember when I was a kid, it's a funny story. You know, I was at the gas station, and, and the guy came up to me, and I was extremely naive, and he said, I got a gold chain for you, bro. I'm going to sell it to you for 400 bucks. And I'm like, wow, $400. 14 karat gold? Yeah, man, this is the best. Sorry, bro, I don't have that much money. You know, I'm from the hood. Oh, okay. Uh, he went from like $400 to 20 bucks, just 20 bucks. Like, man, this is a deal. I'm all about deals. That was a deal. All right, man, 20 bucks. So I take it. You know, I don't even say anything to anybody. I get in the shower, and that gold turns to what? Green. I got duped. You know, he stole 20 bucks. I was such a mongo. I'm not going to get that money back. Don't let me catch you in the street, bro. No. Hey, you know, that happens all the time. Now, that was just $20. You know, I was stupid. I was just, you know, wanting it. You know, what was I thinking, really? From 400 to 20 you know, come on. But listen, there we have to trust that God is going to take care of people like that. You know, I don't got to go chasing him, you know, call them, you know, I, I'm got, I don't have to worry. I just, you know, Lord, you're going to take care of them. You're going to take care of them. They allow others to participate in the process of reconciliation. If you have an issue with somebody and it hasn't been resolved, don't get upset when, when maybe another person tries to approach you and tries to say, hey, can we work this out? Let's, let's meet with that person because I know things are right. Don't, don't reject that. That's not love. Say, okay, you know, you're, you're here to help and you haven't been in this process from the beginning, but I appreciate that. And, okay, I'm willing to take the step. This person, they do not allow the culture to influence them not to forgive. I mean, you don't have to look far on social media to see people get crucified, and there is no forgiveness. And you see people make some ridiculous comments about things they really don't fully understand. Don't follow the culture, you know. Don't get on that train. Don't ride that train. Just think about what Christ would do. Then it says they, they do much more than expected in practicing forgiveness. You may say, you know, I, I never even spoke to this person again after they did this, but now, you know, every Christmas... I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to write them a Christmas card. Even though the last thing on earth I want to do is write them a card. I'm going to, I'm going to buy them a Bible. I'm going to send them a note. I'm just going to bless them instead of cursing them like I used to do. So Paul's writing this letter to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus to accept him in the same way. But here's a question for you this morning, and it's here in your notes. If God were to write you a letter to forgive all relational debt, what names would be found on that list? I'm convinced a group of this size, there are people that you will write down on that list. What I'm here to say today is that it is better to forgive all relational debt. Notice the second one. What would be the implications for your family, your friends, your workplace, your finances, your culture, if you would do that? Listen, Philemon had to deal with all of these implications. But you know what he started doing? He was the first person in this church to start doing something positively about slavery in the New Testament. Paul didn't tell him to go to the government and protest. He said, look, love this man in the same way Christ loved us. He didn't even have to explain what forgiveness was. But he said, because of my love for you, I'm asking you, Philemon, I am appealing to you. I am pleading with you. Please 
do something. I know you can do this. I know you love God. I, I know you love people. Here's what I want you to consider. If you have someone like that in your life that has offended you, if you haven't talked with them, and if you were honest, you say, you know, I probably treat them a little bit more like trash than I should. I want you to picture just for a minute how would your family change if there was true forgiveness and healing in that relationship? How would the relationship with some of your friends change if there was true healing and forgiveness in that relationship? What picture do you think of when that person comes to mind? Is it the same picture that God envisions for that relationship? You say, Marcel, but they, they left me. They didn't pay this. They left me with the kids. They completely abandoned me. Okay? You can still be a loving person in an unloving situation. You can still forgive and not treat that person as less than human. You can still do something to be an example to your kids of what real love and forgiveness looks like. What God wants for us is to release people from their relational debt. I know it's a hard message to hear because I know this is very close to many of us. But just as Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, I really believe, as we read this, he's writing this to you and me. And he's asking the same question. Will you forgive? Will you be willing to accept that person? Will you be willing to accept the consequences? Will you be willing to trust me to take care of all of the loss that you have experienced? If you are, then cancel and forgive all relational debt. Would you join me in a word of prayer and reflection? I know for some of you in particular, this may not be an easy letter to read or message to listen to. I'm sorry for those that have offended you. I'm sorry for the pain that they've caused. I'm sorry for the losses. But forgiveness really is the best expression of love and mercy and grace that we can give to someone else. Don't be enslaved by bitterness and unforgiveness. Right there where you are, if that person comes to mind, if that person was written on your bulletin, just take the first step and say, Lord, I forgive this person for what they have done. Lord, you know I don't feel like it, but I want to forgive them and I want to trust that you will help me to walk in love and show me how to treat them. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, would you consider all that God has forgiven you? Would you consider the unpayable relational debt that you owe to God? If you say, Marcel, I'm here today, but I've never accepted Christ. I've, I've never taken that step. Maybe you were baptized as a child. Maybe you've never really been in church much. We're, we're thankful that you're here. But God wants you to accept his payment for your debt today. The way you do that is through a simple prayer of faith and repentance. If you say, well, I, I, think, I think that's what I need to do. I, I know 
That's what God is asking me to do. Then right there where you are, just pray these words to the Lord. They're not magical words. They're just sincere words. Lord, you know that I am a sinner. I've done many things wrong, and I'm truly sorry for what I've done. Lord, please forgive me for breaking your law. I pray that you would cleanse me of anything in my life that has not pleased you. I believe Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He lived without sin. And Lord, I also believe that he was crucified on a Roman cross. He shed his blood for me. He died and paid the penalty for my sin. But Lord, I'm also thankful that after three days, he rose from the grave. And today I ask you, Lord, to resurrect my life. I accept you as Lord. I accept you as Savior. And help me to live in your love and in the power of your Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for this great letter to Philemon. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.